Hi, good morning everyone. This is Te Hong here. Welcome everybody back from the long weekend and I hope everybody had a good break. So for today, because of the shortened work week last week, we will just be going through some of the results that came out in the early part of last week. And um, you see the names on the screen here. These are the companies we will be going through the results. For myself, For myself, I'll be going through three companies from my sector, Capital Land, Chip Eng Seng. Oh, sorry, two. Capital Land and Chip Eng Seng, and then I'll pass on to Lin Sin and Richard. We start off with um, Capital Land first. So, reported last quarters for last year's results, FY17. I think the key numbers we have to concentrate on, uh, if you look at total PADME, operating PADME, Oper operating PME is up 5%. This is the income coming from the recurring portion of their business. That means to say this will exclude all the portfolio revaluation gains, all your divestment gains. So this is a, is a better reflection of the underlying health of the recurring income portion. You see that it's up 5% and primarily is because of a higher contribution from the Singapore segments but offset by lower contributions from China and Vietnam's uh, development projects. And um, all in all, gross revenue was down and um, that one of the biggest contribu contributing factor for that is because in China, you see that um, residential sales value was down and um, primarily it's a confluence of two factors, slowdown in momentum in the country's uh, sales and also the fact that they had less available units for sale last year as well. And um, last year also was uh, the first time they consolidated revenue from CMT and CRCT and RCST because of the, uh, the fact that they have reached a uh, um, substantial amount of ownership as a result of the um, management fees that they have been collecting in these REITs. On the ground, I think the one of the most striking factor that came out in the results was that the dividends were hiked 20% to 12 cents a share for the entire year and a 20% dividend hike is the first time you see uh, such a hike since 2009 when uh, 2009 you saw that the dividends were hiked from 5 cents to 6 cents and so this is the first time after after nine after nine after eight long years and I think that's a reflection of the confidence management has in the ability of the recurring portion of their business to sustain this 12 cents dividend going forward. Also in the news that came out together with the results was the on block purchase of Pearl Bank. That is a project in uh, Chinatown. Acquisition price was close to 1,005, um, 1,515 actually PSF. And um, so with an estimated break-even price of about, I think, would uh, you can say close to $2,000, you can expect the launch price to be nowhere lesser than around 2003 and up. So if you look at the surrounding comparisons, I think the nearest comparison for Pearl Bank would be Dorset Residences. In fact, the Chinatown area actually has not a lot of supply and not a lot of comparison. In fact, a lot of um, older projects, but Dorset Residences, which is five year old, beside Ottram MRT, I think that is the closest comparison. And that project in the last five years have traded between 1008 to 2005 PSF. So I, I can say, I think the the acquisition price of 1515 looks to be a, a very compelling purchase price. And um, on the China front, I mentioned earlier on, Sales, uh, total contracted sales value in China has gone down. It's down 15% year on year, 1.5. But this has been partially offset by a 60% a jump in sales value in Vietnam. So Vietnam is, is still seeing very healthy growth, although from a lower base. And uh, the contracted sales value in Singapore is stable. We know that capital land before the Pearl Bank acquisition has not a lot of land bank or uh, existing inventory left. So that's a very timely and on block by the group. And um, But sales value in Singapore was able to remain constant because of the bulk sale of the Nassim at the start of the year. 
And uh, another thing to note for them is that in 2017, there was very, very active portfolio reconstitution. We saw that for the entire year, there were 2.6 billion worth of divestments. And with that divestment level, they actually reaped divestment gains of 318 million. This 318 million is a triple, is a tripling year on year over the previous year's uh, gains. And right now, the group has also set a target to recycle 3 billion of investment properties annually going forward. On the capital management front, there has been very efficient capital management because you see that that majority has been, has been extended slightly from 3.3 years to 3.4 but then average interest cost has also gone down from 3.3 to 3.2 percent so in an environment where interest rates are rising they were able to extend that maturity and bring down average interest cost i think that's quite a good feat and um, other operational updates retail in china is stable tenant sales same store tenant sales has gone up from 3.4% in FY16 to 7% last year. Service residences as a portfolio also saw improvements. Be, uh, as a portfolio, you see that total RevPol has grown 1% in FY17. And this compares with Happy a minus... New Year to our TR Sorry. Hi guys, sorry I'll resume from here. Sorry for the interruption. I was at, so I was talking about um I think we were talking about service residences for Capland as a portfolio showing improvements. And um for last year total ref Paul grew one percent after a four percent drop in FY sixteen. And the last point I have for Capland is that um going forward I think uh, revenue will likely be supported by the 10 billion RMB worth of contracts that they have uh, to to hand over in FY18. And on top of that, they also have, um, you see that the services res service residences and offices portfolio are also seeing recoveries. So I think I would expect these two segments to lead the recovery for the recurring income portion segment of their business as well. So all in all, 
capital land, we still maintain our accumulate core. Our target price remains unchanged at 419. And at the current dividend per share of 12 cents, that actually translates to a 3.4 cents yield at current price. Next, we move on to Chip Eng Seng. For FY17, gross revenue was up 15% as well. This was primarily primarily led by two sectors, their property development sector and hospitality sector. The first sector, our revenue was up almost 40% and that came from the progressive recognition of revenue from the two major projects that they launched over the last few years. First one is High Park Residences, that one is 100% sold. Second one is Grandior Park, that one is 88% sold. So you see that over the next two years, as these two projects get progressively built up, the income from all these sold units will start to gradually come in and then this income will actually support the, the, the revenue stream for the group over the next two years and that explains my my titling for Chip Eng Seng in that um, there will there will be strong revenue visibility over the next two years so we expect for these two projects about 210 million uh, in development profits to come in over the next two years just from the sold units alone and um, not forgetting that Grandior Park still has unsold units so any any further sales from here will be further equity. And um, I talked about the hospitality sector as well. For them, the Singapore hotels and Maldives hotels perform better. There were higher occupancy rates at these two hotels. Uh, Alex Park Park Hotel Alexandra was averaging about eighty plus percent occupancy last year, versus the previous year they were doing mid seventies. And then the Maldives hotel that they had. Uh, open uh, in the third queue of last year. Uh, occupancy has gradually ramped up as well. Last occupancy we heard from management is around 50 odd percent. And uh, construction was down and this is because of the absence of new construction projects and slower precast component sales. But uh, to mitigate this impact actually is a very timely replenishing of the construction order book. You saw that La, two weeks ago, they actually won a close to 170 million design and build contract from HDB. And for this contract, we actually expect uh, higher margins than the typical construction projects. So we are expecting margins in the in the high single digits or the low teens. And uh, the rationale for this is because unlike your typical construction projects, this project involves helping HDB to design the flats as well. So because it's a more complicated project, it's designed and built, we, ex we would expect a higher margin from this project. <clears throat> and on the Australian front, uh, residential sales has slowed down a little bit, the momentum has slowed. Uh, you, we saw it from uh, Willow Apartments. And um, so for Willow Apartments, the latest figure is that it's 69% um, sold. At the end of FY16, it was 53% sold. So we expect the sales momentum to improve after the completion of the construction, which will be sometime in the in around March this year, because uh, as projects get completed, the finished product is available. Buyers tend to be more receptive because they will be able to see and feel the final product. But even 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 saying that. We are, we are not very we would not be very concerned with this lower momentum in Australian residential sales for uh, the impact on Chip Eng Seng because you see that the GDV for this project is actually way way smaller than what they have in the Singapore projects in High Park and in Grandeur Park and the Woodleigh project as well. So going forward we expect the um, hospitality assets to perform better because in Singapore in Maldives you see that hotel supply is tapering off and so on top of this better performance from hospitality assets, you have the uh, progressive revenue coming in. I mentioned uh, from these two condos and the Australian one, total 210 million. And also I think a potential catalyst would be the launch of the Woodley site. This is expected to be in the third queue of 1.8. And so watch out for the 
launch, any healthy take up rates will be a catalyst for the share price as well. All in, we maintain our buy call on Chipping Singh. Our target price is unchanged. Uh, dividend at as per last dividend of four cents per share. At current price, it translates to about close to four percent yield, with um, potential capital appreciation upside. So with that, I pass on to Linsin for the rest of the results. Thank you, Tahong. So um, last week, uh, there were three results uh, announced. Uh, one of them, uh, HMI. So for HMI, as you can see that the top line are driven by a high, a stronger patient load growth, especially from the foreign patient, um, foreign patient side, where we have seen a consecutive uh, strong growth uh, from with a double, with a high double digit growth. And as you can see that for this quarter, we are seeing a 16% year-on-year -year growth uh, and it continue to outpace our local patients. This is actually mainly um, due, um, being, sorry, this is mainly because of the two um, Malaysian hospitals are being very uh, competitive in their pricing. Uh, do recall that uh, the medical fees uh, in or the doctor's fees in Malaysia are actually regulated by the uh, Malaysian government as uh, opposed to uh, Singapore side as well as uh, to Thailand side. Uh, management actually shared that um, uh, within the region itself, right, um, if, you, uh, if you look at from the perspective of an Indonesian um, patient, uh, Singapore is usually the, with the highest uh, uh, medical cost. It actually follows by Thailand's uh, international uh, hospital, they are uh, charging a higher, a more aggressive uh, pricing as compared to a uh, Malaysia side. So uh, since that Malaysia's uh, medical fees are being uh, regulated, you can you can um, assume that uh, it will be moderated uh, moving forward as well. So it will remain uh, attractive within the region. Next, uh, next thing to highlight is that uh, we see that the margin expansion coming from a uh, patient higher patient volume as well as a uh, bill size uh, growth this is actually um, uh, coming from a higher outpatient uh, services this is an intentional uh, move by the uh, group itself what they are seeing is that they are uh, they, they saw a higher uh, demand for day sh surgery meaning that uh, uh, you you can conduct the surgery within the day and then uh, the patient doesn't even have to stay overnight in the hospital. With more and more of these uh, outpatient services or day surgery, you can actually see a higher throughput, meaning a higher patient uh, volume turnover. Uh, you can also see a higher um, intensity in uh, the bill size. So this would uh, actually continue to drive the top line uh, and as you can see that uh, it actually flows down to the bottom line uh, where you can uh, see a 27% uh, growth at the NPAT level. Uh, why we are comparing on the NPAT level is because that uh, they only uh, consolidate their uh, non-controlling interest for the two hospitals uh, in the third quarter last year. And in this quarter, they have actually uh, reinstated their uh, interim dividend. The last interim dividend they have uh, paid out uh, was a long time back in uh, around 2008 uh, period. And uh, this time around, they uh, declared an interim dividend of one cent, uh, one ringgit cent. And they uh, started to adopt a dividend policy to pay out uh, at least 20% of their uh, core earnings. And with that, uh, we are expecting a stronger growth for this for the full year of uh, financial year 2018. Um, as you can see that in the first half, uh, NPAT actually has really grown uh, close to 10% year on year. And um, 
second half is actually uh, is typically uh, seasonally stronger. So we are expecting a strong end to 2018. And with that, uh, we maintain our buy call uh, with unchanged target price of 83 cents. Next, we have Old Chunky. Ochanki, we continue to see a, a strong growth uh, for its uh, revenue sales, uh, mainly driven by the new outlets as well as uh, higher same store sales growth. So uh, with this, we are we actually uh, think that um, this are uh, reflective of its uh, continuous effort uh, to drive uh, more demand coming from its product innovations. And uh, the key takeaway or some of the um, negative uh, uh, margin pressures uh, for this quarter um, mainly stems from a higher raw material cost, uh, mainly from the chicken prices as well as the cooking oil prices. Uh, next, we also see that there's a change in product mix where the company, where the group actually um, implemented a, a marketing strategy which promotes uh, lower lower margin uh, product sales as opposed to uh, uh, puff sales. So do note that puff actually generates the highest uh, margin. Then the major um, the ma major cost pressures actually comes from uh, the one off non cash assets write off uh, because of two outlets closures, as well as the startup costs uh, from its uh, UK flagship store. So if you exclude these two items, uh, the start losses as well as the uh, one-off uh, assets write-off, the bottom line actually grew by uh, close to 11% year-on-year. So if um, moving forward, uh, stripping out these two costs, and uh, we also expect that the group will review uh, its pricing and promotional strategies in conjunction of the impending GST hike, uh, we think that uh, the gross margin uh, should be able to improve. And uh, we think uh, our view is that uh, the investment thesis uh, remains intact and with successful integration. Uh, and uh, the old chunky will be able to gain um, efficiency, operating efficiencies, and as well as uh, be able to uh, push out more product innovations to drive sales. So this should be, uh, this could actually pose as an inflection point for Old Chunky. With that, we maintain the buy for Old Chunky with unchanged target price of 98 cents. Next, we have uh, FNN. FNN, um, as we have uh, expect, uh, expected for the past few uh, quarters, we are seeing big sales coming from uh, the beverages uh, segment, uh, mainly stemming from uh, the vehicle sales in uh, Malaysia as well as uh, Singapore. So what happened there it was that uh, due to a seasonal, uh, due to a seasonality where there's a two week shift in the uh, sell in window for the 2000, 2018 uh, Chinese New Year festive season as compared to last year. Another, uh, uh, sorry, um, however, there's two plus points uh, for the, this quarter's result. We are see, seeing that uh, the strong Davis uh, profits continue to support the group's earnings. This is mainly uh, contributed by the newly, uh, sorry, uh, this is mainly contributed by uh, Vinamil. As you can see that it counts for about 33% of the first quarter's EBIT and uh, they plan to uh, um, continue to accumulate uh, the interest in Vinamil. They have just registered their intention uh, to acquire another uh, 1%. So that should be able to push up uh, their stake in Vinamil to 20.5%. Another um, plus, uh, positive uh, to note is that uh, publishing and printing segment, which has uh, um, making losses uh, for uh, about the last two years, it has actually registered its uh, second consecutive quarters of profits. Uh, this is mainly coming from uh, their cost rationalization uh, measures, um, as well as uh, the maiden contribution from the newly acquired uh, Penguin distribution business. 
as we look into the um, the cost side, uh, we are seeing that uh, there are higher input costs coming from sugars, skim milk powder, and packaging costs. So this actually affected the profitability from uh, beverages as well as uh, dairies. And you also see the higher finance uh, costs um, due to the uh, term loan uh, that the group uh, borrowed to finance acquisition of uh, Vina milk sh shares. Uh, nonetheless, um, boost, buoyed by uh, the strong contribution from uh, Vina milk, we are seeing that the pet me actually grew by 16%. And we expect that uh, Vina milk will cont continue to uh, bring in strong growth uh, for uh, FNN's uh, earnings. And with that, uh, we maintain our uh, cumulative call with an uh, unchanged uh, target price of $2.83. So with that, I would like to pass on the presentation to uh, Richard, who will talk about comfort as well as sets. Hi everyone, good morning. This is Richard speaking. Okay, so for Comfort Delgro, uh, we maintain by target price slightly lower, 250. Uh, we forecast the FY18 dividend at 10.4 cents. This is the same as FY17. That will give you a, about 5.1% yield based on the last close price of 205. Uh, for the results, I think, just to summarize it, uh, it has been negatively impacted by uh, competition for the taxi business segment. So that can be seen in the revenue line. So overall, PATME has been down 8.4% uh, year on year. One of the silver lining is that there's a higher dividend for FY17 uh, despite the lower profit. So how that's achieved is from a higher payout. So FY17 payout is 75% compared to 70% in FY16. How this uh, higher dividend comes around is actually from the interim dividend. So the final dividend is actually unchanged at 6.05 cents, but interim dividend for FY17 was uh, 4.35 cents compared to 4.25 cents uh, in FY16. Now I'll talk a bit about each of the major business segments. So starting with uh, bus, Comfort Delgro owns 75% uh, of SBS Transit and SBS Transit had recorded a 50% year-on-year increase in their profit. Uh, this was led by the full year effect of the bus, which is under the bus contracting model. So this year, the SBS Transit had contributed about 12% to Comfort Gross Pet Me. Uh, that's compared to 7.4% the previous year. So uh, that's the impact from the higher profit to SBS Transit, which is uh, accruing to its parent, Comfort Delgro. Next is uh, rail. So if you have read in the media, uh, Downtown Line is on track to hit uh, half a million daily ridership by the end of this year. This is uh, on the back of the opening of uh, Downtown Line Stage 3. So in fourth quarter, the loss for downtown line has widened, but it should narrow from here on because all the peak uh, expenses will be in the fourth quarter where it transitioned from no downtown line 3 to uh, downtown line 3 being open. So now the whole line uh, is open for revenue service. Uh, management outlook for downtown line is that it should turn profitable in 2019. Uh, that is a uh, contingent on two factors that is the daily ridership reaching half a million and as well as um, favorable fare adjustments 
next is a uh, taxi so taxi fleet contracted almost 11 percent quarter on quarter and about 20 percent year on year idle rate for taxi fleet has maintained in a single digit and management strategy for the Singapore taxi business is to continue rationalizing the fleet size uh, according to the idle rate so they'll keep idle rate low uh, so basically it's um, matching the fleet size according to demand next move on to sets sets we downgraded from accumulate to neutral but with a slightly higher target price of 533 we are forecasting 17 cents dividend this year that would be 3.3% uh, yield based on the last close price of 520 uh, revenue was slightly lower uh, there was uh, lower food solutions offset by higher gateway EBIT also lower uh, there was a jump in associates and JV and uh, PADME reported PADME was a 2.3% higher year on year but there was some uh, one-off right back so if you look at underlying PADME is actually 4.6% down some of the we'll talk about the positives and the negatives in the results so the positive was uh, there was a decrease in staff cost decrease was a uh, 3.8% which is a larger decrease uh, compared to the 2.2 uh, 0.2% decrease in revenue why this important uh, staff cost is actually the largest cost component which accounts for 55% of operating expenses so this this is an important number to look at the decline was largely due to the deconsolidation of SETS Hong Kong uh, in which SETS had divested its divested 51 percent and so the remaining 49 percent is recorded as an associate and uh, P&L will appear in the associate line however despite the lower staff cost actually the underlying staff cost had increased uh, next we move on to food solutions revenue so there was some impact there uh, from uh, TFK Corp TFK Corp is their subsidiary in Japan which uh, does flight catering in Tokyo out of uh, Narita and Haneda Airport so revenue was uh, for TFK Corp was 3.5% uh, lower year on year this contributed to the 2.5% lower food solutions uh, biggest impact to TFK was its large customer Delta Airlines uh, is using Shanghai instead of Tokyo as its hub and so that had uh, some impact on the number of flights at Tokyo other cost pressures came from license fees and other costs uh, license fee was 22 percent higher and other cost was 18 percent higher so these are due to the cessation of license fee rebates and the withdrawal of incentives by Changi Airport uh, since 1st of April 2017 overall outlook is a uh, positive for sets they are forming new partnerships to tap on growth in passenger and cargo traffic so they have uh, some uh, ongoing negotiations and memorandum of uh, understanding such as the one the in-flight kitchen in the new Istanbul airport as well as the Air Asia joint venture so you can read more details on the, these uh, initiatives in our report uh, our downgrade to neutral uh, has got nothing to do with the business outlook uh, but rather uh, is on the belief that the market has priced in the growth, growth prospects already and we will still recommend uh, investors to accumulate uh, on opportunistic price weakness okay we've come to the end of the webinar uh, we'll pause now for questions
Yeah, there's a question uh, on positive signs for sets from other areas of business. So if you look at the report, uh, page two, we also talked about their ongoing negos, uh, their uh, concession win for handling at Mumbai Airport. Uh, other than these uh, horizontal integration of existing business to leverage on their expertise, uh, they are also working on vertical integration. One example uh, would be the SETS DFAS joint venture, which they did. Um, other ongoing projects that they are doing is the commissary kitchen in China as well, which is a venture with uh, uh, Ehi Carry, which is part of uh, Wilma. Uh, they don't do catering for cruisers. The business from cruise is a gateway services, not a catering. Hi, there's a question on the news report for Uber planning to sell off its uh, business to Grab. Uh, that at the moment is a speculation and rumor and so that does not factor into our um, model for ComfortDelGro. Yeah, there's a follow-on question uh, regarding sets on how the gateway services for cruise is contributing. Uh, that was not discussed during the recent results briefing. But uh, anyway, that gateway, even if it's growing, that should be uh, quite a small portion in the overall uh, scheme of things because this uh, cruise gateway is just only that uh, Singapore cruise center. Uh, I think there are more exciting things to look at. Uh, in particular, it's the Istanbul airport, uh, JV to do the flight kitchen there. Uh, that So this, I mean, in, if you put things in context, uh, this uh, Singapore cruise gateway is, uh, uh, is, is nothing to shout about. If you look at the Istanbul new airport, that's uh, slated to become the biggest airport in the world. Uh, I think it's supposed to have a uh, 50 or 80 million uh, passenger throughput annually. So um, obviously that should be the more interesting and exciting thing to look at. <laughs>
and just to add on to the previous uh, question about gateway and also the comment, the other thing I think, uh, as I think I mentioned probably in the previous quarter, uh, what the market now is excited about for sets is that uh, joint venture for the Istanbul airport as well as a joint venture for uh, joint venture with Air Asia to do gateway services in Malaysia. So. Just to recap, uh, the joint venture with Air Asia, what SETS is giving is um, Air Asia will get a share of the uh, gateway services at Terminal 4 in Singapore. In exchange, uh, SETS will be doing the gateway services in all the airports that uh, Air Asia is operating in. in Malaysia so that's a big difference and then not only that so currently uh, the existing Air Asia uh, operations for gateway services uh, only services Air Asia so SETS will try to uh, get other airlines as customers on board uh, in the Malaysia joint venture not only that uh, Air Asia has um, operations in uh, Thailand as well, so uh, there's some speculation that uh, SETS would try to uh, start the gateway services in uh, Thailand as well. Uh, there's a question regarding Uber and Grab. Uh, so if the sell-off by Uber to Grab is successful, do you see ComfortDelGro benefiting from it? Uh, it's hard to comment now because we don't even know uh, whether it's happening. And when it happens, uh, we don't know what is the strategy that uh, Grab wants to uh, adopt going forward. So we don't know if uh, they'll just... I mean some possible outcomes is that they will absorb uh, Uber and we don't know how they would uh, go about with their new pricing if they become a monopoly. So uh, at this time, uh, can't really see whether Comfort Delgro will benefit or not. Okay, we don't see any further questions, so uh, with that, we shall end the webinar here. Uh, thank you for attending, and uh, see you again next week.